Good evening. I'm Dr. Paul Heider. I'm current president of the El Paso Cactus and Rock Club, and I'm going to give a talk tonight on cacti of the Northern Chihuahuan Desert. For the purposes of this talk, that pretty much means Doña Ana County and Otero counties in New Mexico, and El Paso County, uh, Hudspeth, Jeff Davis, Presidio, and Brewster County in Texas. Um, now, I'm not a botanist by any means. Cactus is a hobby for me. Um, my training is in ecology, um, understanding deserts and how they work. Uh, cactus is really a hobby, but it's, it's a great hobby and I really enjoy it. Now, having said that, uh, I'm using Powell and Whedon as a reference. They're uh, cacti of the Trans-Pecos region, and I fully realize that their taxonomy is a little bit out of date. Uh, for example, a lot of what is now Escobaria, they uh, refer to as Coryphantha, but uh, just for the purposes of continuity, I'm going to go ahead and stick with that reference. So those of you who have a current understanding of, tech, of cactus taxonomy, bear with me. The Chihuahuan Desert has a wide variety of habitats. For example, we have the creosote flats, which are typical of the warm deserts of North America throughout the southwestern United States. Uh, here we have the Peña Blanca uplift at the south end of the Oregon Mountains in Doniana County, New Mexico. And then here we have desert pavements at the south end of the Big Bend National Park uh, in Brewster County with the Chisos Mountains in the background. A lot of remnant grasslands throughout the region. Uh, much of the Chihuahuan Desert was historically grassland, uh, arid grassland, and that's been changing over the past few hundred years, a couple hundred years, to what we consider more shrublands, shrub deserts. Uh, we are basin and range in formation. Uh, this is a view from the Jaria Mountains looking northeast toward the Sacramento Mountains, uh, the site of a lot of very interesting cacti. This is the Franklin Mountains during our monsoon season. Here in the Chihuahuan Desert, we have a single monsoon season. We get over half of our precipitation from July to September. And that's a great time of year to be here. Although most of the cacti here actually bloom in spring, April, May, and so on. But still, monsoon season is a great time to be here. A lot of nice habitats in our uplands. Uh, a lot of different cacti are specialists on these upper elevations. Uh, a lot of our really neat small coryphantas and such are found here. And this picture shows a good example of what in pre-Columbian times was the basic uh, arrangement of vegetation. Here in the uplands where I'm standing, uh, we have lots of succulents and grasses. Uh, higher up, we get into uh, pinon and juniper. Uh, moving down slope, we get into the darker green uh, shrub region, creosote, tarbush, mesquite, and so on. And then farther out in the flats, uh, the grasslands. And this was a fairly common pattern in pre-Columbian times, and that's been changing over time as uh, we warm up globally, plus as we dry out in the southwest. So uh, we're slowly losing most of our grasslands, unfortunately. Okay. One of our more interesting plants is Areocarpus fisheratus, the living rock cactus. This is a really interesting plant. Uh, it's very cryptic. You can see on the right side there. Uh, it can be quite difficult to find uh, unless you're there in early fall, October, um, when they're in bloom. So you can you can hike around for quite a while looking for these and not find much. But if you're there when they're blooming, it makes it much easier to find. And I know that's the case with many cacti. We can see here there's a plant here, a plant here, and also in the same habitat we get Coryphantha echinus and some of the other little Coryphanthas. But anyway, Areocarpus fissuratus. Then we have Duncan's pincushion cactus, another one of our little Coryphanthas. It's generally a small plant, uh, rarely more than three inches in height, and found uh, on the limestone ridges and similar habitats in southern Brewster County. The sea urchin cactus, Coryphantha echinus, 
I uh, have yet to photograph this one in bloom, but they have a really pretty large yellow flower. Uh, this is a really interesting plant to keep in captivity and cultivation. Uh, seeds are generally available, so this is one I would highly recommend. It makes for a wonderful garden plant. This one was photographed in Brewster County uh, in Big Bend National Park. And then with a much wider distribution, we have the Big Needle Pink Cushion Cactus over much of West Texas, uh, much of the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, the one on the left was photographed in El Paso County. The one on the right was photographed in Otero County, New Mexico. And it has some of the stranger spines that I've seen in any Coryphantha macromeris. Uh, really, really wild spines. I'd like to go back and get a picture of this one uh, in bloom and maybe even collect seed. But they're generally not quite as unkempt looking as that. This shows how large these mounds of Coryphantha macromeris can get. You know, I've got a camera case there for reference. Uh, it would be interesting to know how old this particular cluster of plants is. And then we have a real gem here. This is Nellie's Cory, Coryphantha minima. This is found in the Marathon Basin in Brewster County. Um, in an area where the geology is made up of noviculite, which is a very, very fine-grained uh, mineral. Uh, we find Coryphantha hesteri, Coryphantha minima, uh, Echinocereus uh, davisii here. Uh, so there's a lot of plants that have adapted very nicely to this noviculite environment. And these are small plants, dime size, uh, and they can be very hard to find. There's a lot of moss growing in these uh, plants, or these rocks as well, a Selaginella, I believe. And a lot of these little specialists grow uh, underneath the moss, and they, they're they very cryptic unless they're in bloom. There's a larger Coryphantha, Coryphantha shirai. Uh, these are fairly widespread, uh, but not easy to find. They're not rare. They just don't uh, occur in, in very dense populations. So they're fairly uh, widely scattered. Uh, but when they're in bloom, they're, they're fairly easy to find. And another beautiful plant for gardens, for those of you who keep cacti. Here's another one of the uh, specialists, the Coryphantha snidii complex. Uh, this particular one, Albicolumnaria, uh, I'm pretty sure has been given species status, but at one point it was considered a variety of snidii. Uh, there's several varieties of snidii in the Chihuahuan Desert. It's a medium-sized uh, Coryphantha, a uh, large one might be three or four inches tall. Another Sneeds Cory, this is Coryphantha Sneedii. I'm not sure the variety on this one. This was in cultivation, and uh, there's there's basically Sneedii, variety Sneedii, uh, variety Guadalupensis, and variety Lei, uh, which are easy to identify if you find them in the field because they're found in particular mountain ranges. But being cultivation, I'm not really sure where this one was from. But anyway, fairly typical, uh, one of the small Coryphantha Sneedii complex. And then another Coryphantha, tuberculosa. Uh, this one, I'm sure, has been transferred to Escobaria. Uh, nonetheless, it's, it's a very common plant in the Franklin Mountains uh, in El Paso County, and I'm sure in, in a lot of other mountain ranges to the south and southeast of us. Um, as the plant grows, it loses spines at the base here, which uh, is where it gets its name, cob cactus. Uh, in extreme cases, with many of the spines gone, you really have a very corn cob looking uh, arrangement here. This one is variety tuberculosa. This one I believe is variety uh, uh, varicolor. I'm not positive on that, but uh, anyway, another one of our small uh, rock dwelling cacti. Coryphantha vivipara, the beehive cactus. This is a very common cactus over, oh gosh, much of West Texas, Southern Arizona, 
uh, New Mexico, Colorado, very widespread and always a wonderful cactus to run into. Very, very attractive flowers. Um, another one that's easy to keep in cultivation. Uh, one of my favorites. Then we move into the echinocactus. Uh, this is a canocactus horizon thelonious uh, variety, horizon thelonious. These are quite common in our area. Um, they're an interesting cactus in that they respond to rain for uh, blooming. And so anytime we have any kind of precipitation, all of these seem to bloom at the same time. And I've found in my yard that if I give them a good watering every few weeks, I can get blooms from them on occasion. I know there's another variety of this in Arizona, uh, but the one we have here, uh, Horizon Thelonious, is like I say, quite common and a beautiful plant. Very stout, very, uh, very stout spines on this. And then we have the horse crippler cactus, the kind of cactus texensis. This can get up to a couple of feet across and uh, called horse crippler for very good reasons. Uh, well, having said that, I don't know that it actually cripples horses, but these spines are extremely stout. The plant itself is a tough plant. Uh, you can just about stand on this and not hurt it. In fact, if you stand on this in tennis shoes, I think you're in greater danger of being injured by the plant than you are of injuring the plant. I have yet to see this one in bloom, uh, but it's another one that's this high on my list of uh, plants to have in the garden. Okay, now we move into the genus Echinocereus, the hedgehog cacti. Uh, this is an endemic uh, here. This is found uh, exclusively in Big Bend National Park. This is Chisos hedgehog cactus. Uh, they're easily identified. They have all these little cottony tufts on the aerials. Uh, on the left, there's one just budding. On the right, we have one in bloom. Uh, not a very big uh, hedgehog, maybe six inches for a large one. Uh, but a uh, beautiful cactus, and like many of the hedgehogs, they're, they're uh, wonderful to have in the garden, and uh, they put on a nice flower show. And the kind of serious coccinius. In uh, my neck of the woods here where I live, we have the variety Rosiae. Uh, both of these were photographed in Doniana County, New Mexico. Uh, they're found uh, El Paso County and then uh, into Hudspeth and then down into Jeff Davis County. Uh, very attractive plants, fairly variable in spination, uh, not so much flower color, uh, but they do an interesting uh, thing with the Canisterius dasiacanthus, which we'll get to momentarily. Okay, here we have the Texas rainbow, a Canisterius dasiacanthus. Uh, referred to as a rainbow cactus because on the left picture you can see how uh, every year or so they change colors of the spines so they get this banded appearance. Uh, on the right we have a particularly nice specimen in full bloom and the Echinocereus coccinius and Dasiacanthus in certain areas have managed to hybridize and when we get Echinocereus red arrive uh, which is a hybrid between the coccinius and the dasiacanthus. Uh, I know Javier Garola has given you a talk on this, so you're probably familiar with these. So rather than show you a lot of pictures of the amazing variety, I just threw a few on here. So uh, the, the bottom center is a, it's much more dasiacanthus uh, genes, and the others around the periphery of the slide are just a mix of uh, different genes from the parentals. Uh, the F1s can cross, you know, you know it's, it's a very interesting population. A uh, lot of variability in spination and flower color and even flower shape. Uh, for example, the top center one, the pink one, uh, double petals. Um, to the right of the Dasiacanthus, we have single petals and sort of peach color. Just an incredible variety of flower colors, shapes, and spination in these cacti. And then we have another specialist, the Canisterius davisii, the dwarf hedgehog cactus. This is another one found with uh, Nellie's quarry in the Marathon Basin in the noviculite habitat. 
Uh, this plant is probably about the size of a quarter. Uh, and again, they're very cryptic, very hard to see unless they're in bloom. And this is a, obviously a full-grown individual here. And it will bloom and hopefully set seed, and then it will become uh, very cryptic again and wait for the next season. Uh, but a really neat little plant. Uh, seeds are readily available. Uh, so, you know, for those of you who like to grow some really interesting and kind of serious, uh, the dwarf hedgehog is certainly high on the list. The strawberry cactus, Echinocerius eniacanthus, is fairly widespread just to the south of El Paso County and down into Big Bend. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have this one in bloom, but a, a mound of these in full bloom is really spectacular. Lots and lots of large magenta flowers. Uh, the, the spination is not quite enough to conceal the plant, uh, which is one of the characteristics that helps identify it, as opposed to, for example, coccinius. Uh, another widespread Echinocereus. And then we have another favorite, Fendler's Hedgehog. Uh, these are not uncommon in uh, the western part of West Texas up into New Mexico. Uh, I'm sure, in fact, I know, yes, there are several varieties in Arizona as well. Uh, variety Fendlerized, the one we have here, and another gorgeous plant. And then the strawberry cactus, it kind of says Straminius. Straminius referring to the, it looks like a mound of straw. Uh, wonderful fruit on these, uh, very tasty. And a large plant in full bloom is really impressive. Very beautiful plants. Um, I'm not sure their range west of here, but uh, they're, they're a fairly common plant in much of the Chihuahuan Desert. And these mounds can get up to two feet high and three feet across on a large one. Very spiny, obviously, but uh, a beautiful plant with great tasting fruit. Then we have one of the Viridiflorus group. Uh, this is the variety of Rosanthus, or the rusty hedgehog cactus. Uh, you can see the reddish central spines there. Uh, I put this one out by itself because it's, it's one of my favorites. Uh, there's a lot of variety in Vera de Flores, and there's a lot of different varieties that have been named. I'm not really naming each one, but just to show you the diversity uh, of spination and color in the Viridis, uh, Vera de Flores, excuse me, Vera de Flores complex. Um, and you know, again, there's a number of named varieties. Uh, many of them are found in particular localities in uh, West Texas, but uh, a, a nice a nice collection of different spinations and colors. Uh, this is another one that's nice to keep in your garden just simply for the variety uh, that it provides. Okay, so now we're moving into the Echinomastus. So this is the long central uh, woven spine cactus, Echinomastus intertextus. Uh, here we refer to it as the early bloomer. Uh, these guys would frequently start blooming in late February, early March. And they're, they're fairly common in the Franklin Mountains and, and you know, many of the mountain ranges in this immediate area. Uh, nice little plants. They can get up to six or seven inches tall. Um, multiple flowers. Uh, this one just has a single flower. This is a small plant about the size of a golf ball, uh, but another very nice plant. And then Echinomastus warnockii. This is another one of the Big Bend uh, endemics, uh, you know, one of our, our Big Bend specialties. Only found in certain areas in Big Bend National Park and maybe a few other areas just outside the park. But again, it's, it's fairly limited in distribution. One of those little gems. And here's generally what the, the uh, habitat looks like. So it's limestone, basically chipped limestone uh, ridges. Uh, and there's a large number of cactus you can find you know, in a fairly small area here. In fact, in this view here, this list I have, Echinomastus miracle census, 
Mammillary elastic cancer and potsii, Coryphantus nidii, glandular cactus uncinatus. All these plants can be found pretty much just in this view of this habitat here. It's a really fun place to go hiking and, and photographing cactus. And this is just north of Big Bend Ranch, I'm sorry, Big Bend National Park. Uh, Big Bend Ranch State Park is, all, is also another wonderful place to go looking for cactus. There's a geological formation there called the Solitario, uh, which has some endemic cacti. Uh, so either one of those places, uh, Big Bend Ranch State Park or Big Bend National Park are great places to visit. And the state park is kind of nice because it's not well known yet. So you can go there and spend a day or two and see very few people. Unlike uh, if you get up in the Chisos Mountains, it's sometimes quite crowded. So if you like solitude, Big Bend Ranch State Park. Common button cactus, Epithelantha micromeris. We have two varieties of uh, Epithelantha. I don't have a photo of Bokei, but this is the this is the more common of the two. Uh, these are photographed in the Franklin Mountains. Uh, on the left, we see one in fruit. On the right, we see three of them uh, right next to a uh, Coryphantha tuberculosa. And they're again not rare, but very cryptic, and you know maybe golf ball size. And then the ferrocactus. We have two ferrocacti here. We have the giant fish hook, Ferrocactus hematocanthus. Uh, two views here, one in bloom. These are uh, both photographed in Big Bend National Park. And just to the right of the cactus in the right photograph, you can see one of the cylinder punchias, the dog choyas. And I have no idea which variety that is. We have, uh, I think, four, four or five different species, and I have not bothered to get good pictures or key them out for that matter. So I can say there's a dog choya, and that's about as far as I can get right now. The Arizona barrel cactus. Thank you, Arizona. Uh, we're just about in its easternmost distribution here. It's a wonderful cactus. Uh, unfortunately, in our area, many of them have been dug up and incorrectly put in yards. Uh, by incorrectly, I mean they don't pay any attention to the orientation, and they get put in the yard, and they get burned and frequently die. Uh, you know, if, you, if you know how to properly plant to take care of your cacti, this is a great uh, ornamental, but again, Many of the landscaping services here just don't get it when it comes to moving cactus. So they're getting a little bit harder to find in our area. And then we have glandular cactus, uncinatus, the cat claw cactus. Uh, the one on the left is about the size of a quarter. The one on the right is about four inches in height and in bloom. They're also a relatively early bloomer. Uh, and with the spination, they blend into the grasses very nicely. Uh, they can often be hard to find uh, when they're in a good grassy region. But they're, they're, they're a great little cactus. They're one of my favorites. And then here we go. This is the peyote, Lophophora williamsii. Uh, there are two populations I'm aware of. In Texas, uh, this particular one was photographed in Presidio County. There's another population in eastern Brewster County, uh, much, much more common in Mexico. Um, and it's probably a little more uh, common in the Big Bend region than uh, it seems to be. Uh, part of the issue here is that Texas is mostly private land, and so it can be difficult to really do surveys for cactus. Uh, where this particular cactus was photographed, it was between the highway and the fence line. And the other side of the fence line on private property, wonderful habitat and quite likely many, many, many more plants. But again, being private property, uh, it, it can be a little risky to cross fences out here in Texas. But anyway, so there's a nice little, little group of plants here uh, just between the, the roadway and the fence. Then we get to the mammillarias. This is a very common one, Mammillaria gramii. Uh, you have this in Arizona as well. 
delightful little plants. Uh, some variety in flower color. Uh, both of these were photographed in the Franklin Mountains. One on the uh, east side and one on the west side. I don't know that that has anything to do with flower color itself, but anyway, nice, nice variety. And then we have the Hader's pincushion, excuse me, pincushion cactus, one of the little pancake mantle areas. Uh, here's one in bloom at the moment, and there's a couple fruits there on the right-hand plant. Uh, very nice plant, frequently found under lechuguilla or yuccas. They kind of don't like direct sun, so they tend to grow in somewhat sheltered areas. Um, but a delightful cactus to run into. And then Mammillaria lassiacantha, the golf ball cactus. Uh, another one that on rocky limestone ridges are not at all rare, but they're so small and cryptic that unless they're in bloom, they can be fairly hard to find. There's a quarter there for reference, and they do get bigger than that. Uh, the largest ones I've seen were probably about two inches in diameter, but they tend to be smaller than that. And then Mammillaria meacantha, another one of the pancake cacti. Uh, this one has fewer spines than uh, Hadiri. Other than that, they're very similar. And uh, it's another popular cactus among collectors. They're, they're a very uh, attractive plant, especially when they're in bloom. And again, not rare, just, just cryptic. And then Mammillaria potsii, I believe this is now Mammillaria leona. Uh, down in the Big Bend area, it's eh, relatively common. Uh, these were photographed along the river road uh, just south of Presidio, if you know where that is, in Presidio County. Uh, not at all uncommon, and one of my favorite Mammillarias. Some texts, I think, refer to these as a rat tail mammillaria, which I don't quite get. They're, they're much more attractive than you know, what you'd think from the term rat tail. And then Wright's pincushion cactus. I don't have any really good photos of this one yet. Uh, this is one that uh, was photographed in Duniana County. Um, they're interesting in that they're often found in rocky, open, exposed areas, but also I found them in the uh, grasslands, the Tobosa grasslands north of Las Cruces on the Hornada Experimental Range. Uh, so they, they seem to have a very wide uh, latitude in, in preference for habitat. And spectacular flowers, I just have yet to find one in flower. And then we have the Texas cone cactus, Neoloidea conoidea. Uh, I first saw this plant down just north of Big Bend when I was doing a, a survey for uh, threatened endangered plants in that area. Uh, one of my favorite little cacti. These uh, are, again, not hard to find. They're not rare, but again, somewhat cryptic unless they're blooming. A large plant might be four inches tall. Then we get into the Apuntias. Now, before we start through the Apuntias here, I have to admit they are a tough bunch. Uh, I think I have most of these correctly identified. If I've got any mistakes here, for any of you better with Apuntia than I am, I certainly welcome corrections. Uh, but let's give it a shot and see what happens. So this is a Big Bend purplish prickly pear, Apuntia azuria, variety parva, uh, photographs uh, in southern Texas, again, Presidio County. Very attractive plant, and the flowers are yellow with red centers. And between the blue-gray purplish color of the pads and the yellow flowers, they're a gorgeous plant to have in, in a yard. And not rare. 
and then Opuntia dulcis, I believe. Um, this plant has given me fits, if this is indeed dulcis. Uh, I've looked at several references, and I have a hard time finding anything in common among the references. Um, I'm pretty sure this is dulcis. Uh, sweet prickly pear named for the, the really tasty fruits that it produces. But as I said before, you know, if I've got a bad idea on this, I'm more than happy to, to get corrections. Southern Plains Prickly Pear, Apuntia polyacantha. Not found immediately in our area, but just a little bit to the east of El Paso, they, get, they become fairly common all over the place up in Otero County in the grasslands. Uh, tree Choya, Apuntia imbricata. This is our variety of arborescence. This is fairly familiar to anybody who drives around, especially New Mexico up into Colorado. There's places, oh gosh, southern Colorado up around Pueblo and so on, where there's just forests of these. Another common Choya. Candle Choya, Apuntia clanii. Uh, this one's also in cultivation. Uh, they're found in Presidio and Brewster County and a few other populations in the Big Bend region. And this one's using an Ocotillo for support. We have the long spine purplish prickly pear, Apuntia macrocentra. I think there's a number of varieties of these, but again, uh, the choyas, especially the prickly pears, are a group that just really gives me a hard time. Opuntia rufida, this one's easy. They're, uh, I think, endemic to the to Brewster County. Uh, maybe a little bit larger range than that, but uh, no central spines, no radial spines, just lots of glochids. Uh, the blind comes from the idea, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, they readily shed glochids. And so it's, it's claimed that uh, cattle and other livestock standing downwind from these can be blinded by the glochids as they blow off the plant. Uh, but it's a very distinctive plant, very easy to identify. And then the dog choyas. There's four or five different varieties or species of this. This is Shatii variety Grammii. Uh, this is found uh, El Paso County uh, down into Big Bend. And then the other four varieties are pretty much Brewster and Presidio counties, I believe, but not very widespread. And that's a group that I really have not spent a lot of time with yet. So hopefully down the road I can remedy that. Then the Christmas Choya, Opuntia leptocollis, a uh, fairly low growing slender plant. Uh, one of my introductions to this, uh, I was doing a survey for threatened and endangered plants down in the Sanderson area where uh, Leucophyllum, the Texas sage, is a very common plant. And so as we're moving across the landscape, walking through uh, large bunches of the uh, Texas sage, these grow up in the Texas, Texas sage. So you frequently find these by running into them. Uh, so I kind of learned to uh, not be really happy with this plant, but it, it, it's not the most attractive choya. Uh, called Christmas choya because of the fruit looking like Christmas ornaments. And fairly common, not a rare plant. Twisted spine prickly, uh, plains prickly pear, Opuntia tortoispina, I believe. Um, this is another one that, looking at all the references I had, I couldn't find really solid uh, identification. So as I said before, if somebody has a better ID, uh, let me know. But it's it's fairly widespread to the east in, in uh, arid grasslands. Should be a fairly common cactus.
the spiny fruited prickly pear, another one that's easy to identify. Very, uh, very distinct uh, aerials and very distinct spination. Another big bend endemic. It's believed to be a hybrid. I'm not sure who with, uh, but it's a very, very distinct plant and easy to identify. I'm always thankful when any of the prickly pears are easy. And then the Comanche prickly pear, Opuntia comanchica. Uh, this is a, a very common plant in the El Paso area. Uh, red spines, reddish spines, uh, yellow flowers with red centers, which over time turn orange. Quite common in our area. And finally, leaving the Opuntia, we come to Thelocactus bicolor, Glory of Texas. Um, these also were photographed in the same area as the uh, Potts Mammillaria uh, on the River Road uh, in Brewster County. Brewster or Presidio County? Maybe Presidio County. Uh, they grow, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll clump fairly well, and when they're in full bloom, they're gorgeous. And this is another plant uh, that's in high demand by collectors. They grow easily from seed, and seed's readily available, so no reason to dig up any of these plants. Seeds pretty much available for almost everything I've shown you tonight. And then finally, uh, and these have been in alphabetical order, so I didn't really arrange everything taxonomically. I uh, hope that hasn't been too weird. Uh, but finally, one of my all-time favorite cactus, the Gramagas cactus. Tumea or Sclerocactus now, Papyricanthus. So on the left, you can see the plant in bloom quite clearly. These wonderful central spines look just like the blades of the uh, Tobosa grass. On the right, the large picture, you can see sort of a ring of the grass. And right in the center of the ring, uh, let's see if the cursor picks it up. There's three plants right here. One, two, and three. And they are really nice little cactus. They're hard to find. They're not rare. They're just extremely cryptic and uh, uh, one of my favorites. Um, I was first introduced to this cactus way back when I was a teenager living up in Albuquerque. And I found one of these out in the grasslands there and it really kind of sparked my interest in cactus. Okay, now having said that, we are done. Um, you know, these are always a little interesting uh, doing this virtually. Normally we'd have time for talking and questions and interactions, so this would actually last a little longer. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for uh, tolerating my uh, ignorance, especially of the Apuntias. And I hope this has not been a total waste of your time. And so uh, thank you very much. And uh, see you down the road. Hopefully when this whole virus thing is wrapped up, we can do this in person. Have a good night.